Hello. How many of you have ever seen a Dilbert comic strip? Okay. That's good. Yeah. Well, if you've seen a Dilbert comic strip, then you know what failure looks like. Uh, but today, I'm going to give you a template for success. Um, I would like to warn you in advance that you should not take any advice from cartoonists. If you have ever taken any ad important advice from a cartoonist, there's a really good chance it didn't work out. So what I'd like you to do is to look at my template for success and compare it to the crap you've been told before and make up your own mind. All right, my template for success has three main components. Starting with, goals are for losers. <laughs> Passion, totally overrated. But luck can be manipulated. Well, sort of. I'll explain that. Uh, first, a little context. I have failed many times, 36 times that I counted, and that's just in the business realm, all right? If I gave you my personal failures, that would be a whole other presentation here. I'm gonna show, you, show them quickly. I don't want you to dwell on them, uh, but they range from failures in uh, real estate, physical businesses, internet businesses, startups. I've got intellectual property failures, uh, movies, television shows that didn't work out. Got just about every kind of failure. I don't have time to talk about all of them, so I'll tell you one of my favorite, more embarrassing ones. When I was about 20, I had an idea for an invention. It was a brilliant idea, I thought, and it was the combination of a rosin bag that would attach to a, a tennis player's shorts so that they could dry their hand between points so it wouldn't slip on the racket. And I thought, this is a brilliant idea. So I took it to a patent attorney, and I showed him my idea, and he sat across the desk and he stared at me silently for a while, and then he spoke rather slowly because I think he thought that I needed that. <laughs> and he explained it this way, just because you can attach two existing products with Velcro, that does not make it an invention. So although that invention failed, as many of my other projects did, I did learn a lot about intellectual property uh, in that process, which has served me well in, in many other areas in life. And so too, all the other failures, they all had something to teach me. So while they didn't work, um, I found that just about 10% of the things that I've tried has worked out really well. Now, as it turns out, because most of the things I tried were sort of high-risk, high-reward types of things, you would really expect most of them wouldn't work, but a few of them did. Uh, one of them was this, the Dilbert comic. Uh, wearable, wearable computing is the next big thing. This is my prototype of a necklace computer. Prepare to be shocked. Did you just talk him into wearing a remotely controlled shock collar? <laughs> People think I have no goals. All right, so, so speaking of goals, um, 100 years ago, when things were simple, goals made a lot of sense, right? So if you were a farmer and you said to yourself, uh, I think I need to clear 40 acres before winter, and that was your goal, that was very clear, it was simple. You knew that your farm next year would look a lot like your farm this year, with the exception of the 40 acres that you cleared. Everything was kind of predictable, it was simple. But today, just imagine the complexity of your cell phone, all right? You gotta pick a carrier, you need a, a voice plan, a data plan, you got your 4G, your Wi-Fi, your apps. There's more complexity in your pocket today than the farmer's entire operation. So in this context, of today where everything's changing, you know, your life is changing at the same time the environment is changing. Having a goal is sort of like being on a horse that's galloping with a bow and arrow, and you're trying to shoot at a target that's somewhere off in the forest, in the fog, the target is also moving at the same time, and you only brought one arrow. Now sometimes you'll hit that target. It means if enough people with enough horses shoot enough arrows, 
somebody's going to hit a target, right? And that person will write a book and say, goals. It's a good thing I had a goal, all right? <laughs> but the odds are not that good. The odds of hitting that target in this complicated world where everything's changing at the same time. Another problem is that when you're focusing on your goal, and really that's the whole point, right? If you have a goal, you're focusing on it. Otherwise, what would be the point? But while you're looking at it, maybe there's stuff out here that you're not looking at that could have been better than whatever your goal was. So you might be missing a whole bunch of stuff that are great opportunities you just didn't notice. So given these limits of goals, what's better? What's better than a goal? Well, I would recommend a system. And I'll define a system this way. So it's something that you do on a regular basis that improves your odds, but not in a way that is, has a specific goal. In other words, your odds of success are better, but you don't know exactly where this is heading yet. And importantly, and this is really the key to it, you want to make sure that your personal value is increasing even if your projects are failing miserably. Because in the long run, that improvement in your value and the odds are going to work out well. Let me give you some examples of a system versus a goal. When I was in high school, I had a friend, Manuel. Manuel and I both liked girls and we both wanted to have girlfriends. But we had two very different approaches to this. Uh, I had what I would call sort of a goal-oriented approach at the time. I would, pick, I would pick a specific girl that I thought I wanted to make my girlfriend. And I would spend months trying to figure out how to, how to run into her accidentally and find out who her friends are and what interests she had. And after my months of planning and preparation, usually I would discover that one of three outcomes were possible. Number one, she would say, I have a boyfriend. Number two, she would say, I do not like you. <laughs> but sometimes, and this is the important part, sometimes, and it didn't happen a lot, sometimes she would say, I have a boyfriend and I don't like you. <laughs> so, um, on the plus side, I did not contribute to teen pregnancy whatsoever. <laughs> My friend Manuel had a completely different approach. He had more of a systems approach. He would go into a room full of women and he, or girls and he would say to each one of them, would you like to be my girlfriend? Or my, yeah, would you like to be my girlfriend? Or worse to that effect. And of course his failure rate was tremendous, but because of the law of numbers, he would uh, usually find somebody who would say yes. But this isn't a story about just the law of numbers. That, that part is somewhat obvious. What was interesting is that every time Manuel went to, through his process, he was learning a skill. He was learning uh, which uh, pickup lines were working best. He was kind of doing A-B testing on, on these girls. <laughs> and, and he was also learning to take rejection, so that no matter what happened, he was becoming more valuable as it went. Here's another example. I've got a friend who was my tennis partner who uh, had a process that I'd never seen before. He would interview for jobs that he didn't want. Uh, they would be jobs that paid substantially less than he was already making, or jobs that had unpleasant commutes. There were things he would never take, even if offered to him. But he worked at home in, in a technology job, and so this allowed him to network, to meet people he wouldn't have met otherwise. And he also used it as practice. All right? So every time he went to an interview, he became better at selling himself. One day, about a month ago, he said, I won't be able to play tennis with you every Wednesday because I went into this job interview for yet another job that I knew I didn't want. And at the end of the interview, the interviewer said, well, you're totally overqualified for this position, but the head of the department left, you'd be perfect for that job. So that's the job he took with a huge promotion. That's a system over a goal. He didn't go in there for that job, but he increased his odds every time he followed his system. Here's another way to do it easily. Um, there, there are a number of skills that I would call complementary skills that you could kind of layer on top of whatever else you're doing. Um, for example, I took the Dale Carnegie course to learn how to do this. If you add public speaking to anything that you're doing already, 
you're probably a candidate to be the boss at some point just because you've got that little extra skill. And you're probably thinking to yourself, I can never do that, I don't want to be a public speaker. Trust me, everyone in the Dale Carnegie course, and I'm not selling that, I'm just using that as an example, uh, they were all bad speakers, they all became good speakers. All of this is learnable, but you don't have to be the world's best at any of this stuff. You just have to have a working facility with it, and it automatically will double your, your odds just because you've got these extra layers. Now, how good do you have to be at any of this stuff? Well, let me give you an example using myself. Um, you may have noticed that I am not a good artist. Uh, I'm a mediocre artist at best. Um, I never took a writing class. Um, I can get my points across fairly clearly, but I'm not a great writer by any stretch of the imagination. If I have a party in my house, I'm not even the funniest person in my own house. All right? I'm funny enough, but I'm not the world-class funniest person who ever lived. I know a little bit about business, but obviously you can see from my 36 failures, I don't know a lot about business. I'm not the best business person in the world. But when you combine those four skills that I've tried to improve through practice over the years to the point of being eh, pretty good, together those just pretty good skills created the Dilbert Empire that's in 2,000 newspapers in 65 countries. Here's, uh, uh, here's another example, um, more from your personal life. Uh, between, it's the difference between a diet um, goal and a system, all right? Again, I, um, I warn you not to take any health advice from cartoonists. <laughs> Bad idea. Right? These are simple examples of a goal versus a system. All right, your, your goal might be, I want to lose 10 pounds, right? I'm going to use my willpower. I'm going to uh, resist the cookie, resist the cookie. Uh, it's hard. And every one of you knows, the people who, who try to use their willpower to lose 10 pounds, sometimes it works, but keeping it off is gonna be pretty hard. Compare that to a system. So a system might be, for example, uh, that you try to replace your need for willpower, which science has now shown is a finite resource during any given day. If you use up your willpower trying to resist eating, you'll have no willpower left to resist whatever else bad tempt temptations you've got. So if you could replace willpower with something else, such as knowledge, that'd be a good thing, right? So this is the system I use. Let me give you an example of how you could replace willpower with knowledge. Uh, you probably all know that uh, vegetables are more healthy than cake, right? So everybody knows a little bit about food, but let's say you went to the salad bar, and you had a choice between pasta and a white potato, all right? And you wanted to uh, watch your waistline, and let's say you liked them about equally well, how many of you, by a show of hands, would pick the pasta? How many of you would pick the potato? How many of you don't want to raise your hands because you would be embarrassed by the answer? <laughs> all right, the answer is pasta. Pasta has a much lower glycemic index. And so it is that if you learned as much as you could about food, simply knowledge would allow you to make choices that would help you um, not need willpower. So if you go to the salad bar and pick the potato, I pick the pasta, you get fat, I don't. You say to yourself, man, that cartoonist, he's got a good me metabolism, doesn't he? Yeah, but that won't be the case. All right, now you could also replace knowledge or replace willpower with knowledge by simply learning over time, and this is gonna take a long time, which types of flavorings you could put on this god-awful healthy food to make it not so awful. So maybe it's the soy sauce, maybe it's the mustard, maybe you salt it a little bit more. And eventually, the quality of that cookie up here, which is delicious, isn't so much better than the healthy food that you're learning over time, how to flavor and season until the need for willpower is diminished. Third thing is that Cravings are easily um, changed. So you probably think that your cravings for the thing that's your weakness, oh, that chocolate, uh, I, can't, I can't resist that. You probably think that that's somehow baked into your DNA. But I would uh, you know, point out that the people in India eat Indian food and the people in China eat Chinese food, which 
I believe they call food. Um, <laughs> and none of this stuff is baked into you. So I can't get into the, the details of how you would change your craving, but I will tell you that it has to do with knowledge and technique and it has nothing to do with willpower. Similarly, with exercise. You might have an exercise goal that is to run 10 miles a week or run a marathon. All right, you need your willpower. <laughs> no pain, no gain, you think? But I don't think people thought that through because really, anything that hurts you and is painful and is unpleasant, over time, you're gonna figure out a reason not to do it anymore, all right? So it's like the dog who touches the electric fence, like, ow, 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 maybe I won't do that anymore, <laughs> okay? So instead of hurting yourself, how about a system? And again, I'm not recommending this. It's just an example of a goal versus a system. You could try to replace your need for willpower to exercise with habit. Now, a habit can be, uh, can be built simply by doing something on a daily basis uh, every day, because that's what causes habit, and giving yourself a reward at the end. So here's what I do. I consciously underdo it, all right? If I know I could run three miles today, if I really tried, but it's gonna hurt and I won't be able to do anything tomorrow, I don't do that. I just run two miles, all right? So every time I'm done exercising, and sometimes it's just walking the dog, because maybe I just don't have it in me that day, I feel good. My energy is lifted, and that's really the game. You're trying to lift your energy, right? And once your energy is lifted, at the end of it, maybe you give yourself a delicious protein shake, a nice cup of coffee, whatever, whatever it is that you like, and eventually you train yourself like the dog to um, want to exercise more than you don't. The people who exercise every day have already figured this out. If you're trying to exercise three to four times a week, you're probably hating it, all right? If you bring it to seven, but don't kill yourself, it becomes a habit, and I can tell you that at 11 a.m. every morning, my foot starts tapping, and my body just wants to go do something because I've trained myself, like my dog, to, to do this thing on a regular basis. Here's another little uh, hack for exercise. I learned this uh, when I was learning to be a hypnotist. So I took courses in hypnosis, and here's one of the little tricks they taught us. You know there's those days you come home and you want to exercise and you have time for it, but you just don't have the energy. You're just drained. It just can't happen today. Try this. Put on your exercise clothes. Just put on your footwear that you're going to use for running, put on your clothes, and just walk around your house for a little while. What you'll find is that the association of the clothing and just how it feels on your body will trigger the subroutine in your head that brings up that energy and brings you into the exercise frame of mind. It works about 70% of the time, I think you'll find. Um, so summarizing what a system is, if you've got a system for your diet and a system for your exercise, that's going to increase your energy. Every study shows that if you've got uh, better energy, you're going to perform better on tests. Everything about you is going to be better. You'll have more charisma when you walk into the room. These are all good things. And uh, once your energy is up, then you can take on all of these projects. Individually, these projects might be gigantic failures. But collectively, each of them might teach you something that is increasing your odds over time towards success. So while your personal value is going up, you're learning more things, your odds are going up, is that enough? I mean, is that enough to get you to success? I would say probably not, right? You need more than that, more than a system. What about passion? Do you need that? Well, ask any billionaire. They all say it, passion. Right? You, you interview a billionaire and they say, passion is the secret to success. You gotta have passion. But what else could they have said in public that wouldn't make them sound like jerks? All right? <laughs> what are the other things you can say? Well, I'm smarter than poor people. <laughs> no, right? Can't say that. Uh, you can't say, uh, I did some insider trading and that got me started. You can't say, I was lucky because that ruins your mystique. There's nothing you can say. I had a boss when I was a commercial lender at a bank years ago who said, the guy you don't want to give a loan to is the one who has passion. He said, he's in it for the wrong reason. The one you want is the grinder, the guy who comes in with his spreadsheet 
He says, I'm thinking about opening a dry cleaning uh, franchise. These numbers look really good. I'm going to work really hard. I've got some relevant experience. That's the guy you want to give the loan to. So I said this to my friend. I was talking to him about the, uh, the overvaluing of passion. And he said, no, there's no way I'm believing that. Passion has got to be important. He goes, look at the, the winners of American Idol. All right? Those people had to have passion. Obviously, they had passion, because you couldn't get to that level without a lot of passion. I said to him, have you watched the entire season where in the first few episodes, they show entire stadiums full of people who are all very passionate? If you win by the numbers, you would have to say that passion is more correlated with abysmal failure than with success. <laughs> in, <laughs> in fact, I would go so far as to say that the formula for success, whatever that might be, you could probably pick out passion, that variable, and everything would be just about the same. All right? So instead of passion, think of it in terms of boosting your personal energy. You want to be physically and mentally alert and energetic and willing to take on stuff, power through the things you need to. That's not really passion, which is a little bit irrational, but physical energy is a good thing if you're working with a system. Now, I'm double mugging because I heard that passion is necessary for success. By 4 p.m., I'll be so passionate, I'll be dating my chair. <laughs> Nothing about that sounded right. <laughs> All right, so if passion isn't the key, what is? How about luck? You know, luck is kind of the elephant in the room, right? There is no such thing as someone who is successful without this big honking piece of luck, including me. All right? Now, I, I don't have time to tell you all the lucky things that happened with Dilbert, but I will tell you there were a lot of unlucky things that happened with the things that didn't work out. But luck, you can't really control it, right? It's like lightning. You know, lightning does what lightning's going to do, hit you where it doesn't hit you. Isn't that true? Well, kind of. But if you wanted to get hit by lightning, it would help to go outdoors um, in a rainstorm. And if that wasn't enough, because it really isn't, you could go on top of a mountain, you could hold a, a lightning rod, and if one lightning rod isn't enough, you could plant a whole bunch of frickin' lightning rods, network them together, hold on to one, and wait for it to rain. Because you can't directly control luck, but you can certainly move from a game that has bad odds to one that has better odds, all right? A researcher named Dr. Richard Wiseman studied luck and lucky people. And he was trying to find out if there's any such thing as luck. Of course, there isn't. But he did discover an interesting thing. He found that people who considered themselves lucky, people who feel like luck is going to find them, had a wider field of perception. Not vision, but just what, what they perceived. They would literally notice opportunities that other people wouldn't notice because they weren't expecting any opportunities to be there. And here's the cool thing. He found that you could take someone who thought they were unlucky and just make them do kind of uh, positive thinking exercises. It didn't matter if it was affirmations or prayers. It, it, the technique didn't matter so much. It was just if they got their mindset that luck was out there, if they would just look for it, they would actually notice more things, right? So uh, if you have a choice between a goal and a system, if it's a simple situation, it's very predictable, goal might be fine. But in the complicated world where you're looking at where's my career going, what's, what do things look like next year, very unpredictable. Maybe you need a system to boost your odds overall so that luck can find you. Passion, a little bit overrated, but definitely work on your health and your energy. If you don't have that, it's going to be tough to do, get anything done. Luck, can't manage it directly, but you can change the game. All right, I'm going to take you out on four different comics. Um, some of them have actually something to do with this content. Um, what is the key to success? Hire the right employees. How do you know you hire the right ones? You know because the business is successful. So the key to success is circular reasoning? Yes, because circular reasoning is the key. <laughs> I worked around the clock and finished a project that would normally require 10 programmers. 
Um, did I just establish a new baseline expectation that will turn my job into a tragic death march? It's time to set some stretch goals. Stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> Experts say lazy employees are the best because they know how to find shortcuts. So you found a lot of shortcuts? Me? No. I'm not lazy. I'm useless. <laughs> then why did you bring it up? Why wouldn't I? I'm not lazy. <laughs> this last comic has nothing to do with anything. It's just my favorite comic of all time. Thank you very much for listening. I hope there's something I said here that's useful for you. I'll go out on this one. My boss says we need some eunuch programmers. I think he means Unix, not Unix. And I, I already know Unix. If the company nurse drops by, tell her I said never mind. Thank you very much. <laughs>